1 Samuel chapter 6. Look at verse 1. So the Bible reads here right here, and the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. And the Philistines called for the priest and the diviners, saying, What shall we do to the ark of the Lord? Tell us wherewith we shall send it to his place. Take that off there. And they said, If ye send away the ark of the God of Israel, uh, where are you at? Send it not empty. Then any wise return him a trespass offering, and he shall be healed. And it shall be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. Then said they, What shall we? shall be a trespass offering, which we shall return to him. They answered the five golden emeralds and five golden mice, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines. For one plague was on you all and on your lords. Wherefore you shall make images. Okay, you already said that. Wherefore then do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaohs hardened their hearts. When he had wrought wonderfully among the people, did, 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 not, the, uh, did not let they, the people go, and they departed. Now therefore make a new cart, and take two milch kine, on which there came no yoke, and tie the kine to the cart, and bring their calves home from them, and take the ark of the Lord, and lay it upon the cart, and put the jewels of gold, which ye returned him for a trespass offering, and a coffer by the side thereof, and send it away, that it may go, and see if it go up by the way of his own, car, uh, his own coast to Beth Shemesh, then he hath done us this great evil. But if not, then we shall know it is not his hand that smote us. It was a chance that happened to us. And the men did so and took the milch kine and tied them to the cart and shut up their calves at home. Look at verse 11. Now they laid the ark of the Lord upon the cart and the coffer with the mice, uh, with the milch of gold and the images of the emeralds. And the kine took the straight way to the way of Beshemesh and went along the highway, lowing as they went. And turn not aside to the right hand nor to the left. And the lords of the Philistines went after them unto the border of Bashemesh. And they of Bashemesh was reaping their wheat harvest in the valley. And they lifted up their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. And the cart came to the field of Joshua a Beshemite and stood there where there was a great stone. And they cleared the wood of the ark and, uh, and offered the kind a of burnt offering unto the Lord. And the Levites took the ark of the Lord and the coffer that was with it wherein the jewels of gold were, and put them on the great stone. And the men of Beshemesh offered burnt offerings and sacrificed sacrifices the same day unto the Lord. Key thing right here, verse 16. And when the, five Lord, uh, when the five lords of the Philistines had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day. Now, if you ever read 1 Samuel, uh, the two chapters before that, the Philistines had a great victory over the nation of Israel. It was such a one-sided victory. It was terrible. It was, uh, it was pretty uh, disgraceful. And what happened was that when they won, they took all the spoils, but they made one error. They took the Ark of God. And when that happened, all this mischief, all this misfortune came upon their nations, I mean, on, on their cities and on their lords. And so finally, after much destruction and mayhem, they went to their priests and their diviners to ask for guidance on how to fix this. Now, before I move forward, I'd like to ask you, have you ever asked somebody to help you? Whether it be here or whether it be our, our God? If you haven't, then that's probably the reason why you're still sinning. And that's probably the reason why you're still suffering. But what I find very interesting in verses 3 through 8, when they're, the priests are explaining to the five lords how to get rid of this problem, after all that explaining, they plainly said, uh, back at the verse, when they say, if it's not of God, they say, but if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand that smote us. It was a chance that happened to us. So after explaining verse 3 through 8, if this doesn't happen, then they're basically saying God doesn't exist. That's basically what they're saying. So if these things don't happen, when you do this, then their God is a false God, no different from ours. But bless God, it was not a chance that happened unto them. As the cart came to Beshemus, those Jews saw the ark of God and they rejoiced when they saw it. Have you been thinking as of late that by any chance that God doesn't exist? Or the trials you guys go through, each and every one of you, do they mean anything? Are they worth suffering for? Are they worth crying over? Well, I'd like to tell you that God is real. He is so real that he destroyed a city and a false god in his own temple. That's how real he is. That's 
That's how amazing God is. God is so real that He's that missing piece in your life that caused you to be worrisome and caused you to go back and sin again. Not because He forces you to sin, but because you choose to take Him out of your life. I would say to you today that God is a witness to and against the unbelievers in this world. And He uses you to do that for His glory. And I hope in this sermon that you will get a blessing out of it. And I just hope that there will, there will be some uh, pointers that will hit. So don't take it in offense, but it's taken it from the Word of God. The top of the message today is it ain't no chance. So let's pray. Uh, thank you, Lord God, for the ability to preach. Um, I just thank you, Father, that uh, I'm able to be here, Lord, uh, while our pastor is away. Uh, you know I'm nothing, Lord. Uh, anybody gets behind there is nothing, Lord. They just need you, Father, to preach, God. And we need the Holy Spirit right now, Father. Please, go, God, please fill it up, Lord. Uh, they, they don't want to hear me, Lord, Father. They, they want to hear the book. So please just uh, bless the sermon, Lord. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So my first point is it ain't no chance with the Philistines. It ain't no chance with the Philistines. So in verses 1 through 10, here are the Philistines are inquiring to their priests and the diviners to figure out why are they suffering? Why are they going through these, these tumults? And they tell them plainly, this is what the problem is. So, but how are they in that position? How, how did they get in that position? What caused them to be in this state of panic, this state of, uh, of, uh, uh, of seriousness? We're going to go to 1 Samuel chapter 5. This ex kind of explains what happened. 1 Samuel chapter 5, or what was the result after they defeated the nation of Israel. 1 Samuel chapter 5, and we're going to read the whole thing. 1 Samuel chapter 5, verse 1. 1 Samuel chapter 5 and verse 1. It reads, And the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. And when they of Ashdod arose early in the morrow, behold, Dagon was fell upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. And they took Dagon and set him in his place again. Before I go any further, as it was plainly stated, Dagon's head was cut off, his arms were, his hands were on the ground. And what I find very interesting right here is that here they are trying to put him back on his shoulders. They're trying to put something that's wrong, put it in its place because they, it couldn't possibly have God that, that smote it. But I'd like to ask you this question. How many times has God gave you a victory in your sin or in your life and then you simply just wow. grab Dagon's head and just hey, good. put it back? You know, we tell, uh, in the Bible it says to reprove, rebuke, and exhort, but how many times have you also gone to the altar and said, oh God, I, I, I'm sorry for this, I'm sorry for that, but your mouth is speaking, but your heart doesn't mean it. So now, here are two things that you're doing. One, you're doing the sin that you're still doing, and now you committed a sin against God for saying something that you don't mean. Whatever is not a faith is sin. So now you're doing two sins. If you believe this, then you will take this seriously. This isn't some laughing matter. This isn't a sermon that's going to make you feel warm and cuzzy. You're going to be exposed here. Go to Isaiah 41. Go to Isaiah 41, verse 10. But brethren, here's the thing. God strengthens us, and He helps us. You may have those times where you feel hopeless and like God's not with you, but He's there. He's always there for you. He doesn't desert you. Isaiah 41, verse 10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. God never fails us. It is us who fail Him. And no matter what, how many times that you fail, no matter how many times you may think that He's not with you, you're wrong. God is with you. Okay? You may go prodigal every once in a while, but he wants you to come home. That just shows right there he's not against you. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I find it very interesting that when you start going to your lost friends, like for example, when I, started, uh, when I got saved and I kind of started talking more about Jesus Christ, it's amazing how your friends that you were doing a lot of things with, right? You, done, you got close to going to jail with. You got, uh, did you know, some things that you shouldn't have done together. 
And the moment that you start bringing about Jesus Christ and you start witnessing to them, they start saying, uh, what? No, man, get, get away from us. There's actually a brother that told me that when he, was, when he got saved, uh, he told them about uh, what happened, and they said, uh, yeah, bye, and they just left him. He hasn't seen him since. And those friends that he's known for years, and they just, off of one person, one person changed their whole opinion of you. That's right, brother. Now, if we go back to 1 Samuel chapter 5, 1 Samuel chapter 5, and that's not supposed to scare you. That's actually supposed to help you because it shows that those weren't your friends. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Friends don't abandon you just by one thing. Yeah. If that was the case, then, man, I don't want no friends like that. Yeah. So in verse 3, we, we see right here in verse 3 that Dagon's head is cut off. But in verse 4, it's a nice little reminder of what happened. Read verse 4. And when they arose early on the, mor on the mor morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. He did this twice because once to show these people that it was God, and the second time to show you that he did it. Because some of you probably read through verse 3, and so he put verse 4 to show you, hey, dummy, I did this. So are you going to love that false thing in your life, that idol, that sin, or whatever it is you have over me? Well, this is what I can do to your sin. That's good, brother. Thank God that God is real. And by his power, it is ultimate power. It is not by chance. I remember when I was, uh, when I was lost uh, before Christ, uh, and I actually did think this. Uh, this is how far gone I was. I used to think nobody could kill me because I, I had this very uh, uh, prideful mindset. I used to put myself in situations that a fool would do. But thank God that he, something happened to me, and it got so bad for me that if I were trying to go outside, I would freak out. I would get in, break in a cold sweat, because I didn't know what was going to happen, because I finally experienced that death doesn't, does not discriminate. He'll pick you in every time he wants. If it's going to be today, it's going to happen today. If it's going to be tomorrow, it's going to be tomorrow. If it's going to be 10 years, it'll be 10 years. But you don't know what's going to happen. And so thank God when I got saved, I realized that there is a supreme being, a power that I cannot understand, but now I know he knows me. And thank God I know him. Amen. If you read verse 5 in 1 Samuel chapter 5, it reads, Therefore neither the priest of Dagon nor any that come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod of this day. But the hand of the Lord was very heavy upon them of Ashdod, and he destroyed them and smote them with emeralds, even Ashdod and the coast thereof. And when the men of Ashdod saw that it was so, they said, The ark of the God of Israel shall not abide with us, for his hand is sore upon us and upon Dagon our God. Remember what Paul says in Romans 12, verse 9, he says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather put your place on the wrath. It is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. You got to keep that in the back of your mind because there are a lot of people in your life that you probably witnessed to and people before Christ that you had a past with and those are the same people that are now the thorn in your flesh. And they may be maybe emotionally hurting you, maybe spiritually uh, hurting you through witchcraft or whatever, or maybe even physically hurting you. But, and I know we're all for the Second Amendment, you know, you know to bear arms. <laughs> uh, I'm for it. Yeah. Uh, even the Lord Jesus, he, he talks about uh, how you need to sell your shirt to get a sword, obviously about self-defense. But here's the thing, is that even if that is scriptural and that is biblical, can you still trust God and uh, handle your safety? So if you can walk down to, uh, to uh, 40th Street in Oakland, where it's all about bloods, can you really walk down that street and say, okay, I, God, you got me. I won't, I won't worry. I'll witness to these people. That's the, that's the level of trust you got to have. And it's easier said than done, I know that. But if you, can get, if you can get a hold of that, if you can just understand that kind of mindset, man, you'll go a long way. Go to verse 8. It reads, They sent therefore and gathered all the lords of the Philistines unto them and said, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? And they answered, Let the ark of the God of Israel be carried on to Gath. So that was basically a, a diss towards the ark of God because Gath is not a, it's like a step down. 
and they carried the ark of the God of Israel about thither. And it was so that after they had carried about it, the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction. And he smote the men of the city, both small and great. No one was safe. And they had emeralds in their secret parts. Therefore they sent the ark of God to Ekron. And it came to pass, as the ark of God came to Ekron, that the Ekronites cried out, saying, They have brought about the ark of the God of Israel to us, to slay us and our people. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines, and said, Send away the ark of the God of Israel, and let it go again to his own place. Let us slay us not and our people. For there was a deadly destruction throughout all the city. The hand of God was very heavy there. In verse 12 it reads, And the men that died not were smitten with emeralds, and the cry of the city went up to heaven. God will carry out his judgment for his people, because not only does he love us, but he will also perform crazy, miraculous destruction on gods that are not real, that have no power, because he is power. He has authority. He is not idleness. He is supreme. God loves his children, and we should love him, no matter what you go through. Whether it be something in your family, whether it be some kind of uh, sin you're going through, or whether it be something that you're seeing in the future that's going to happen, regardless of what it is, you should always love him, because he's the one holding you. My second point is, it ain't no chance with the ark. It ain't no chance with the ark. So verses 11 through 15, we see the lords of the Philistines did what they were recommended by their priests and diviners. There was no stumbling of the cart, okay, nothing. There was no wind that gushed about it. There was no fool trying to pick the cart and have it stop. It went. So what that shows, it reads, oh, I'm on 2 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles, there we go, verse 11. 1 Chronicles, chapter 29, verse 11. It reads, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. When you need to realize is this, is that God, no matter what is going on in this world, he is the greatness, he is the power, he is the majesty, he is the victory. Everything is his and you are his. Ain't that a blessing? Amen. I mean, to me, that, that's a blessing to me. And don't forget that because when you go through those moments where it feels like no one is around you, no one is for you, God is for you. Now, as the ark was, was going down, and it was going down the hill, and all those Jews saw it, and they were rejoicing to see the figure, go to Numbers 21, because this is a really good picture of something. This is a really, really good picture of something. Numbers 21, verse 8. 21, verse 8. As that car came down, here are the, the Jews just... Working and working and working, not thinking something, a blessing is going to happen. And lo and behold, a blessing does happen. Verse 8, Numbers 21, verse 8. Numbers 21, verse 8, it reads, And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a certain had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Just like how in John 3, where Jesus Christ talks about the Son of Man being lifted up as a serpent in the wilderness, some of you just got to look up. That's good. You got to look up sometimes, because you're looking down all the time. If you're looking down, you can't see what's up. Yeah. If, you know, if you look down and you got your eyes closed, all you see is darkness, and on top of that, you're looking down towards hell. You're not going to hell, but when you're looking down, that's essentially what you're looking at. But if you look up, even if you have your eyes closed, you can still see the light. And if you open your eyes, you'll see the light. Now go to Deuteronomy 31. Deuteronomy 31. Verse 3. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 3. Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 3. 
The Bible reads, The Lord thy God, he will go over before thee, and excuse me, he will destroy these nations from before thee, and thou shalt possess them and Joshua. He shall go over before thee as the Lord has said. And the Lord shall do unto them as he did to Sion and to Og, kings of the Amorites, and unto the land of them whom he destroyed. And the Lord shall give them up before your face, that ye may do unto them according to all the commandments which I have commanded you. Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. That last part, for the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee, that he will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. You know, just to give you an idea how crucial this thinking is, I don't know if you ever studied about the Titanic when it was sunk in 1912. I think it was in April. I think that was the month. Um, what happened was the person that was in the crow's nest, he had the binoculars, and he was supposed to watch out. Okay, he was supposed to look out for icebergs, make sure nothing was going to happen, they won't hit anything. But the captain figured he needed them because, you know, he's the one who knows everything, apparently, not the person who's in the crow's nest. And so here's what happens. Off of one decision, one decision, thousands of people perish. Off of one person's decision. Now, in contrast to that, here is Noah. Noah's coming in. And every, as Brother Ralph was talking about in his study, people are banging at the ark, trying to, get the, trying to get in. And they can't get in because they made a decision. Just like how Noah made a decision. Noah made a decision that, hey Lord, you know what? You're more faithful to me than I was to you. Thank you, God, for everything you've done for me. Thank you for the blessings. Thank you for the, the fruit. Thank you, Father, for everything in my family you've done for me. I'm going to trust you on what you're saying about this flood that's coming from heaven. Even though I... I I don't know if that's even possible. I'm going to trust you because you said it. Now, if that's the case, have you at any point trusted God like that? Here comes a crazy moment that's going to occur in your life, whether it be some kind of a, a catastrophe, whether it be something that uh, you've been struggling with, and you know when you get home you're going to struggle with something. Are you, have you ever in those moments just say, you know what, God, it's going to happen, so I'm going to trust that in your Bible you tell me that you're with me, and you'll never forsake me, so I'm going to go through it. And that's happened, and you haven't, and you dropped the ball, that's on you. That's on you if you drop the ball, because God was with you. And if you can get a hold of that mindset, your walk will be so much easier. Yeah, you'll go through a lot more pain and suffering, but it'll go a lot more easier, because you've got somebody holding you up. Be, uh, be glad and rejoice, because God, no matter what, He'll be there for you. And it's to show our faith towards those that do not believe. And that is my last point, which is, it ain't no chance with the five lords. It ain't no chance with the five lords. If you go back to our, first, uh, our main text in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 6, 1 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 16, where it reads, And when the five lords of the Philistines had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day. Now, can I just say, church, that God will use anything for his glory. He will use anything. It doesn't matter if it's someone like a small little child or somebody who's spiritually, you know, a giant. He's going to use anybody to show his glory. Because it doesn't matter what it is. He can use anything. Go to Isaiah 43, verse 9. Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43. You know, in sports, typically, they don't pick somebody who's small and weak. In sports, it's the exact opposite. You want to look at the guy that's tall, built, and strong, can jump high, can run, can fast, all that. Because someone who's small is a liability. Someone who isn't, you know, naturally gifted in certain things, humble brother, uh, can't support the team. Now, there are some, certain sports where that does help, but and across the board, typically, you want a strong-built person because that's going to show strength. It's going to also intimidate the other team. But thank God, he doesn't look at the outward man. He looks at the heart. I don't know. To me, that's just amazing. Because sometimes, throughout my life, it's always been the exact opposite. So Isaiah 30, 43, sorry. Isaiah 43, verse 9. Isaiah 43, verse 9. It reads, let all the nations be gathered together and let the people be assembled. 
Who among them can declare this and show us former things? Let them bring forth their witnesses, that they may be justified. Or let them hear and say it is truth. Ye are my witnesses. There you go. Ye are my witnesses. So you are the ones that can confess that he is truth. Saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God form. That's right, there is no God form, neither shall there be after me. God uses all of us as witnesses to give him his glory. And he grants us that honor to do that. He doesn't grant some high and mighty dude. He doesn't grant some people that are locked in their basement reading the scriptures and then trying to disprove pastors when they got no business doing that. That doesn't make sense to me. I don't, I don't get it when you got some dude who literally has no business speaking about anything regarding the scriptures and yet somehow he thinks he can kick pastors. That makes no sense to me. He obviously doesn't fear God. And then you try to justify when Paul rebukes Peter. First of all, those are two elders. You're not an elder, fool. Like, I don't, I just, man, it's amazing how men are just, ah, I don't get it. Now, those that are against you will one day acknowledge you, whether it be in this world, and they finally get saved, and you witness them for so long, and they're like, you know what, I, I was rude to you for this, this, for this amount of time, I was really disrespectful to you during this time. But you know what? After all of this, you've always kept true what you were saying. I'm going to listen to what you have to say now. I was, I was hearing, but I wasn't listening. Now I'm going to listen. And then they get saved. Or what's going to happen is that the moment that they get cast into, into the lake of fire, they're going to think, I should have listened to them. And that's not on you. You gave the witness. That's on them. You've got to stay faithful to God. That's very important. You have to stay faithful to God. Uh, I'll, I'll, I remember when I, when I actually uh, left church because of a certain reason. And, what's, and it's funny because, you know, uh, sin lasts for a season and you enjoy it for a season. And finally, when that season was over, uh, I started building this huge just gap in my chest. I couldn't figure it out. It was this big hole that I couldn't understand how to fill it. I filled it with certain things, didn't work. Filled it with sports, didn't work. Filled it with... Uh, uh, friendships didn't work, filled it with uh, something else, didn't work. And so finally, over a period of time, uh, one day, a faithful day, uh, this sister and Amen. brother Sean uh, came to where I was working. And it was, and it was interesting because it was not on their way to their home. It was random. Uh, where, you guys were went shopping, went shopping yeah. <laughs> and, and all I hear oh, is, oh, is that Max? And I was like, oh, I'm like, oh what? That's Kirsten and Sean. And so... Um, we were talking, and I actually couldn't look at Sean, because uh, Sean had that, he had that uh, dad face. He was looking at me, disappointed. And, uh, and so Kirsten, she, she went off uh, to go shopping, and then I, I couldn't say anything to Sean. And so finally, Sean was like, bro, look at me. And I was like, and he's like, where have you been? Like, where have you been? I, I couldn't answer him. I couldn't answer him at all. And he's like, hey, you know what? Don't worry about it. New church place, come here next Sunday. I went next Sunday, and man, after the service, I went to my car, I bawled, I cried, and what I did is I looked up and I said, God, please forgive me. Please forgive me. Thank God when that happened, in the glory world, when that was occurring, my name that had dust on it for a prayer request in the, in the wall of the saints, that was taken off, I had a little prayer request in there, and the Lord Jesus took it out, and he was walking along the gold streets. Everybody was saying, oh, hell, oh, hell, Emmanuel, glory to the Most High. He was walking through here, and finally he went to the Father, and he said, Father, here is a prayer request. He opened it, stood up, and said, as you are my truth, and I am the creator of all things, this man is forgiven. He is saved. Yes, and yes, he will be forgiven. He is my child, and he comes back to home. And I will simply close with this. It ain't a chance in your life. It ain't a chance with God, and bless God, it ain't a chance with your faith. That's all I got. Uh, the altar car is open, uh, every head bowed and every eye shut. Um, I just want to say thank you, Lord God, um, for the privilege to preach today, God, and, and just thank you, Lord, Heavenly Father, to be up here. And, uh, you know, God, thank you that we're able to understand that 
through our trials and tribulations, through our pain and suffering, you are real. It ain't no chance when it comes to you, Father. Uh, everything has a purpose when it's in your life, uh, in our life. And uh, man, Lord, just thank you. Just thank you for being so good to us. Um, just thank you, Father, for things that you've given us, things that you've uh, allowed us to go through. And, and uh, more importantly, Father, just thank you that uh, even though we've, we've suffered and even though that uh, there are times where we felt like the Philistines were going to just destroy us, um, they didn't destroy us. They may have uh, dwindled us down, but they didn't completely destroy us. And you were faithful to us. And uh, though we were never faithful to you, Father, you were faithful to us. And we just thank you, Lord God, for that. I just pray, Lord Father, that as we grow older and as we wait for your coming, Lord, uh, that we will not only be uh, perfected and will be uh, even more beautiful for you to see, um, but we will all rejoice and be able to see you in that faithful day. And, and God, just thank you so much that you know, even though we may have, uh, we may have um, went away and we may have uh, gone prodigal, we may have uh, forsaken you from time to time again, uh, you never, you never, not once, uh, thought, uh, you never once uh, uh, cast us away, Father. And just thank you, Lord God, that we're able to have this time. And, and, and Lord, just also, Lord Father, I just pray, Lord God, that uh, whatever's going on with people in their life, Father, um, I just pray that they'll be able to get right with you, Lord, and, and, uh, and just have them know, Lord Father, that it's time that, you know, they, they've been messing around with some things, Lord Father, and, and you know what they are, Lord. Um, so I just pray, God, that they'll be able to get right with them as they're here. And, and God, just, just thank you, Lord, that we're able to come to here assembled and be able to worship you, Lord. And um, just thank you, God, so much uh, for the pain and trials. And um, thank you, Father, for the brethren. Uh, Lord God, thank you so much, and uh, I just pray, God, that now as we are getting ready to close, I pray, Lord Father, that you please be with us for the rest of the day. Um, I just pray, Lord God, that the sermon was used in your way and the way how you want it to be preached, not by my way, but, but by yours. And uh, just thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity to be here, Lord. And we ask you things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>